Hello everyone, the 2024 Oscars are behind us and after a much needed break, I'm back to give you my first very early predictions for the 2025 Oscars. I know some of you might be saying, why, why? Don't, it's so far away, so early, why do this? But this is less about predicting and more about just, you know, getting pumped for what films that we have to look forward to this year and films that we think could be big Oscar players. So here were my first early predictions for the 2024 Oscar season. Seven out of 10 films ended up being nominated, but let's just dive into the films coming out this year that, that I think could be big ones. And I'm just gonna go ahead and start in order with the films that I have the most confidence in. Again, many of these films don't even have trailers, so this is just pure speculation at this point. So some are definitely gonna miss, some are gonna hit, and that's just part of the fun. But without further ado, let's just dive into it. Now, a lot of people are gonna make predictions based on subject matter. Honestly, I really lean heavily on track record and, and who's directing. So starting with the film, I decided to place at number one, I have Kinds of Kindness. This is another Yorgos Lanthimos film. Of course, it's starring just recent winner Emma Stone. It's got Jesse Plemons in it. It's got Willem Dafoe. It's got Hung Chow. It's being described right now as an anthology film, uh, as a triptych fable. So from Poor Things, we got the cinematographer, Robbie Ryan, coming back. We got the composer. He's coming back from Poor Things. But this movie is written by... Yorgos Lanthimos and Ephthimos Philippou. This is the same writer who wrote The Lobster with him. Uh, he wrote Killing of a Sacred Deer, uh, Dogtooth. So that's something that maybe hints towards it not being an Oscar player since The Lobster, Killing of a Sacred Deer, and Dogtooth weren't big Oscar players. But this is being distributed by Fox Searchlight. Uh, it's being released on June 21st. I guess that's a con. It's getting released pretty early. It's an anthology. Maybe that's another con. Those movies don't typically do so well. The pros being the cast is stacked. Like any Yorgos film, there's a big cast. And this one's a very impressive one. A lot of previous nominees here. Now, the trailer doesn't necessarily scream Oscar, but I don't know. I feel like Poor Things didn't necessarily scream Oscar either. And that did really well. And also, you know, there's always things that are hidden in Yorgos Lanthimos. The trailer is ambiguous at this point, so really no one knows what's going on. And I don't know, I just have a feeling that maybe this could be like a fun little, like three billboards type of movie. And yeah, I'm just at a place right now that I'm not willing to ever doubt Yorgos unless he has a major misfire. So yeah, I'm putting that number one. And also when I just look at the films that are coming out, nothing is really popping out at me as like, yeah, that could win. So this is kind of a placeholder if I'm being honest, but I still think it could be a contender. So number two, that's where I'm gonna put Blitz, directed and written by Steve McQueen. This is starring Saoirse Ronan. This movie sounds pretty interesting though. I, I believe it follows a story of a group of Londoners during the events of the British capital bombing in World War II. So the event is actually taken from an historical event nicknamed the Blitz, which was a German bombing campaign in 1940 to 1941. It's being distributed by Apple TV Plus. Yeah, when looking at films, I usually look at directing, talent, that's number one. And then I go down to like editing and cinematographer. This is edited by the editor of Power of the Dog. The cinematographer is from the guy who did Little Women. So yeah, there, there's a lot of, of talent behind the camera here. And McQueen, Steve McQueen, you know, he doesn't pump out films. His last films was Widows, which got no traction at the Academy. But his previous film, 12 Years a Slave, obviously big hit at the Academy. His series, uh, Small Axe, was also really well received. And you know, this isn't a genre film. Blitz is not gonna be a, a movie like Widows. So I think this is something that I think we can expect will be really well reviewed and add in Sir Sharon into the mix. And I think that makes, you know, a recipe for an Oscar film. So, so Blitz for the win, probably not, but I think it could be a film that garners a lot of nominations. So I think it could be a big one. Number three, that's where I have Dune part two. I think. Dune 2 is looking to pick up the same nominations as the first one. So, you know, we're looking at 10. Plus, if you add in, you know, the potential director, assuming they don't snub him again, then you might be looking at 11. I don't see Dune 2 picking up any acting awards. I think that's the main challenge here. If, if I had to say someone would, I 
guess I would go with Javier Bardem because because they love the guy and I love the guy. But I, I don't I don't know. I don't see it. Now, in terms of winning Best Picture, I'm of the thinking that if it's going to happen, it's probably going to be the third one, like Return of the King. The challenge with Dune 2 is whether I think it's going to be remembered. You know, the first one was released in October. Dune 2 was released in March. So, you know, there's a possibility that Dune 2 could even underperform compared to the first. But the second one got better reviews to kind of help that. So I do feel very safe. So Best Picture win for Dune 2? Not likely, but a Best Picture nomination feels very, very safe to me. And number four, that's where I have Sing Scene. So this premiered at TIFF. Um, I saw it. I reviewed it. This stars Coleman Domingo and also real life formerly incarcerated actors. They're in the film playing kind of versions of themselves. We got Paul Racy. It's directed by, I think his name is Greg Quadar, I think is his name. And I'm, I'm not convinced that this is for sure going to be a Best Picture nominee. If it is, it's going to be like Coda. It's going to be like Coda. It's, it's not an obvious safe pick. It's either gonna like capture people's hearts or just won't. And it just will be a small movie. But here's the thing. If the film gets nominated for SAG Ensemble, Sing Sing could really win that. Like probably easily win that. Any film that wins SAG Ensemble should be taken very, very serious. I think the challenge is it's, it's definitely gonna be nomination light it's it's not going to pick up all these crafts i don't imagine and i think a, a director nomination is is going to be pretty tough also uh, it didn't like place at tiff for audience choice so right now we're kind of looking at sing sing kind of like it's going to be this year's coda where it just it's like lightning in a bottle it captures the heart of the voters or it just comes out and it's a nice little movie and then it just kind of goes away something like you know trey edward schultz like waves you know the film independent nominations but just doesn't like make the main stage. What it has going for it though, the film is heavily about acting and will definitely appeal to actors. I could see Coleman Domingo potentially winning for this. I could see a best supporting nomination, even for uh, Clarence Macklin. He, he was a kind of a standout of the movie. It's distributed by A24, so that is a big deal. I think this is probably gonna be their, their big swing. But yeah, I gotta put Sing Sing on the list. It's it's gonna be like this year's Coda or maybe even like Sound of Music. All right, so moving on to number five and that's where I have Joker Fale Adu directed by Todd Phillips. This seems to be about the Joker and Harley Quinn's meeting at the asylum. And we got the whole team from the first Joker coming back to do the second one. You know, we got Lawrence Scheer, previously nominated for Joker. It's written by Todd Phillips and Scott Silver, previously nominated for Joker. It's edited by the same editor as Joker. Music by Hildor Gunnadir. Gunnadir? My name is Hildur Gunnadir. Ah, I can never get that name right, but she won for Joker. She's coming back. So the sequel is reported as being a musical. It's going to have, I believe, 15 songs, but most of them I heard are covers of pre-existing songs. I've heard the word um, jukebox musical being thrown around, which, which is like a little concerning. Variety reported this one, by the way, to have a $200 million budget. And that, compare that to the first one. I think the first one had like $60 million. So there's a big jump up in production quality. Tricky thing is the Academy already awarded Phoenix for the first one, which kind of places them in a predicament that, you know, if... Phoenix is on par or is as, as good as he was in the first one. So do they award him again or, or, or will they say, you know what? We got Phoenix last time. Let's, let's put the focus on someone else like Lady Gaga. Another thing going for it, the release date, October 4th. It's a nice sweet spot. You know, the fact that it's also not called Joker 2, I think is very, very wise. I think that helps the film a little bit. The musical aspect is the one that's the most interesting. Like this might, be like that one bathroom scene in the first one where he dances stretched to an entire movie, which which sounds like awful, to be honest. I think we're going to see a repeat of the first one, though. I think I think people are going to really love it. And then when Oscar nominations come out, it's going to be a little too late to realize maybe we over nominated it. So the first one got 11. So maybe this one gets like, I don't know, 8 to 10 somewhere in there. I have to say, though, the trailer, the trailer looks pretty good. Even I was excited to see it after seeing that trailer. The color grade and the lighting, I think 
I think it just looks incredible. So I think this might be a big spectacle of the year. Unless something crazy happens, I have a hard time believing that Joker 2 is not getting in. I think it's getting in. All right, so the next one I'm taking a little chance on. At number six, I got Hard Truths. This is directed by Mike Lee. So previously nominated before for Secret and Lies, and I think he was nominated for Vera Drake, right? And then we have a little Secret and Lies reunion. We got the Marianne Jean-Baptiste, who was nominated before for Secret and Lies. So the plot right now, it's kind of super vague. On IMDb, it says it's a ongoing exploration of the contemporary world with a tragic comic study of human strengths and weaknesses. So super vague. But hey, Secret and Lies is Mike Lee's most successful film. And I'm getting very Secret and Lies vibes here. His first film set in contemporary times since another year in 2010. So he is due for a little bit of a comeback, I think. We got cinematographer Dick Poop or uh, Dick Pope nominated before for The Illusionist and Mr. Turner. I actually was considering putting this film number one. The one downside, it, it's distributed by Bleecker Street, which doesn't have like the most amazing, you know, showing at Oscars. But I have a good feeling about this one though. I have a good feeling about it. I think it's gonna spark up conversation about how great Secret and Lies was. And I think, you know, Lee's a respected director. He's got prestige. Also with the Academy, you know, it's kind of becoming a little bit more international and I can see a lot of top tier nominations, you know, like screenplay and director and acting. So yeah, hard truths, I'm putting it in there. The next one I'm taking a risk on. I got number seven, I put Night Bitch. So this is a film I'm not, I'm not seeing hardly on anyone's list and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why. No one seems to have really any faith in this movie. So maybe I'm missing something and I think it's probably the premise that's scaring people away. It's based on a novel about a stay-at-home mom who decides to break her boring cycle and starts to believe that she's turning into a dog at night. So that could be what's deterring people, but I don't know. It's directed by Marielle Heller from Can You Ever Forgive Me and A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. I think Can You Ever Forgive Me is super underrated. I think she's got great taste, so I don't really think this is gonna be bad. The one concerning thing I will say though, it's the cinematographer is Brandon Scott Trust. He he did the Coyote versus Acme movie that was scrapped. He did Bros and he did Sonic the Hedgehog too. So I don't know, I guess if it was gonna be a big Oscar player, maybe like they wouldn't get the cinematographer from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. The release date is December 6th. So I heard Night Bitch was originally set to be released on um, Hulu, but it was later announced for a theatrical release by Searchlight Pictures. But there's something that I'm kind of intrigued by. Before the film even started filming, Searchlight Pictures acquired the distribution rights from Annapurna for 25 million, winning out from five other bidders. So there was a bidding war for this film. The way the movie is being described right now is as a neo-horror comedy film. So I'm thinking like this could be this year's like Promising Young Woman maybe, I don't know. The director called it a darkly hilarious tale of motherhood. So yeah, I'm taking a chance on Night Bitch. I, that's my little Hail Mary. I think the title is catchy. I think the premise is something that will get people talking. And honestly, I just trust Marielle Hiller's taste to be honest. And also the return of Amy Adams, there's a narrative there. And I wanna see Amy Adams be really great in a movie. And I think everyone does. So yeah, Night Bitch, let's go for it. And number eight, I have Conclave, directed by Edward Berger. This is from the director of All Quiet on the Western Front. It's starring Ray Fiennes, Stanley Tucci, John Lithgow. I believe it's a thriller. I heard it's about a cardinal tasked with finding the successor to a deceased pope, discovering the former pope had a secret that must be uncovered. So this is from the uh, writer of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the cinematographer is from the cinematographer of Captain Fantastic. It's being distributed by Focus Features. It's got the same composer, by the way, as All Quiet on the Western Front, which won him an Oscar just a couple years ago. But I'm not like fully confident on this being an Oscar player. I think it could be kind of like Mikhail Halavishis, like the artist director, his follow-up film, how it didn't really do anything. But, you know, director Edward Berger with Fines is really why I have this here. So yeah, Conclave. Number nine, that's where I have The Apprentice, or as people may be 
calling it the Donald Trump movie. The film is directed by Ali Abbasi. He's the dude who did Holy Spider. It's starring Sebastian Stan. He's playing a young Donald Trump. We got Jeremy Strong. Uh, we got Maria Bakalova. So this is written though by Gabriel Sherman and it is his first feature film screenplay. He's a journalist typically who writes for Vanity Fair and he's written some political biographies. So, you know, currently it's not attached to any major studio from what I've found. So the plot focuses on the relationship between Donald Trump and Roy Cohen, a New York City prosecutor who was famous for working with Senator Joseph McCarthy during the second Red Scare. So this might be kind of like, you know, like a Wall Street movie, like a like a mentor protege story exploring how Trump came to be. It's shot by the same DP and editor behind the worst person in the world. But I think this really hinges on Sebastian Stan's performance. The movie being about Trump is kind of both why I think this project will turn heads, but also could be an obstacle in getting nominated. So it's, it's kind of a question mark for me, but I think the fact that they're kind of doing something a little earlier in his life, I think that does help. But yeah, the thing that kind of the movie hinges on, on Sebastian Stan's performance and how Trump is kind of portrayed. It's a very delicate balance. All right, number 10, that's where I have The Nickel Boys, directed by Ramel Ross, nominated for before for a documentary uh, made in 2019 called Hale County This Morning, This Evening. The film is starring Anjanou Ellis Taylor. The plot, uh, it's based on a 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner. So this is based on a historic reform school in the 1960s in Florida where there was notorious abuse treatment of the students. So let's see. So it's edited by Nicholas Monsoor, who did Us and Next Goal Wins and Nope. So it's being distributed by Amazon MGM Studios. And it's got a $23 million budget. Honestly, I kind of have this movie in because of the prestige. You know, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner. And also that $23 million budget. It's, it's pretty sizable. Pretty sizable for a movie like this. But I don't know. I don't know. This could be like this year's Emperor's Club. A film that probably four people watching this remember. Or this could be this year's Women Talking. Another MGM film, by the way. We'll see. And then right outside the 10, that's where I have Furiosa. That's where I put Furiosa, Mad Max Saga, directed by George Miller from, of course, the Mad Max series, and 3,000 Years of Longing, which I think, I think is really underrated, in my opinion. But I will say the hype doesn't seem to be as excited for this one. And the CG does look a little bit more apparent in the trailer. And, you know, this is going to be the first Mad Max movie where Mad Max is likely not going to be even in it. It kind of feels like a tug and war with Dune 2 because I kind of feel like Dune 2 takes the wind out of its sails a little bit because the film kind of has a similar design. But maybe Furiosa will kind of take the wind out of Dune 2 sail a little bit. You know, the first one got 10 nominations, including Best Director. I guess ultimately it's just kind of really tough to imagine Joker 2, Dune 2, and Furiosa making it in. It's a lot of, you know, action-y sequels. So we'll see. Next, I have Bird. This is director Andrea Arnold from American Honey and Fish Tank. It's starring Barry Keoghan. The cinematography is Robbie Ryan. And it's unknown right now what this film's about, but it's rumored to focus on the fringes of society. So perhaps it's going to be another American Honey type of film. Something I did read is that Barry Keoghan actually picked this role over a villain role in Gladiator 2. So I don't know, with the, the Academy again being more international and Arnold being a, a respected director, you know? And also this could be a big hit at Cannes. This is playing at Cannes. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for the Cannes movie. So I think this could be it. Next, I have A Real Pain. This is directed by Jesse Eisenberg. This premiered at Sundance. It's starring Kieran Culkin, Jesse Eisenberg. The movie tells a story about two misfits, relatives kind of traveling through Poland. Again, like I said, it premiered at Sundance, did really well there. It was picked up by Searchlight. Also, Kieran is kind of the actor of the moment right now. It's also a really great role. It's got a lot of depth and complexion to it. So I think it could be something that could win an award for acting. So yeah, I, I have that in there. Next up, I have Queer, directed by Luca Guadagnino. Jesus, this guy just, he just pumps out films, doesn't he? It's starring Daniel Craig, Leslie Mansville, uh, Jason Schwartzman. It's based on a novel of the same name. 
It's set in 1940s Mexico City. It follows Lee, who has fled from a drug bust in New Orleans. And now in Mexico City, Lee wanders around the city clubs and becomes infatuated with drug user Allerton, a discharged American Navy serviceman. So this is being described as a historical romantic drama. And it's written by the same writer of Challengers. The music is uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Uh, that's edited by the editor of Bones and All and Challengers. The release date. Right now, I don't think there's a release date, but I think it's being released in late 2024. So it could be uh, a big contender. And I think this could be um, Call Me By Your Name all over again. All right, next, I'm trying to keep an eye out for more potential international spoilers. So that's where I have The Room Next Door. It's directed by Pedro Malvadovar. It's starring Julianne Moore and Tilda Swinton and John Totoro. Currently for the plot, we know that this surrounds a rift between a very imperfect mother and a war correspondent and her resentful daughter, as well as with the former's relationship with the author. You know, Almodovar doesn't always hit, but he is beloved and the Academy is becoming increasingly international. And also the film's gonna be in English. So, you know, it's gonna appeal to the non-international voters, but Pedro is gonna help appeal to the international voters. So I don't know, I think this could be a hit. And, you know, potential acting uh, nominations always with his films. So yeah, that's why I have his film in there. And speaking of directors that always seem to get their actresses in, I have Maria, directed by Pablo Lorraine. So Angelina Jolie plays American-born opera singer Maria Callas. Uh, the film is set during her declining years in 1970s when she was um, living in Paris. So I'm getting very like La Vie and Rose vibes. It's a, um, it's a rise and fall story, I believe. In her final years, Callis spent her life, most of her life in isolation and died of a heart attack. So it's gonna be one of uh, Pablo Lorraine's bummer movies. It's gonna be a bummer female-led movie. So <laughs> I don't know. The cinematographer though, is three-time Academy Award nominee Edward Lockman, the guy who did Aconde and Carol and Far From Heaven. It's written by Stephen Knight, who wrote Spencer, uh, but also Serenity. So I don't know, I, I, I think I'm just gonna stick with the idea that Pablo Lorraine is probably gonna get in uh, Angelina Jolie and probably not much else. I'm just gonna stick with that. And then next, that's where I have Piano Lesson, starring John David Washington, Daniel Deadweiler, and Samuel Jackson. Now, this is another uh, Netflix August Wilson adapted movie. All right, it's set in 1936 Pittsburgh. It follows the lives of Charles' family, including an heirloom, uh, the, the family piano, which is uh, decorated with designs carved by an enslaved ancestor of theirs. So the screenplay is by Malcolm Washington, Denzel's other son. So it's a family project. And Virgil Williams, previously nominated for co-writing Mudbound. So I don't know. I mean, Samuel L. Jackson was nominated for a Tony for the same role. I believe he's going to be the uh, storyteller of the story. And he's going to be giving the accounts of the uh, piano's history. So yeah, just looking at Fences and Ma Rainey. Fences got in picture. Ma Rainey didn't. But for some reason, I, I don't know why I don't have as much faith in this one. I think... Right now, I'm, I'm not feeling like this is going to be a big one, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And then next, I have the end. This is director Joshua Oppenheimer, or as Al Pacino would say. And Maria is C. Oppenheimer. This is the director behind um, the documentaries, um, Act of Silence and um, Acts of Silence, Act of Killing and A Look of Silence. This is actually going to be his narrative debut. It's, it's starring Tilda Swinton, uh, Michael Shannon's in it. And I believe it, it's about a wealthy family that lives in an underground bunker two decades after the end of the world, which they've contributed to. So the genre, I, I believe it's a, described as a, an apocalyptic musical film. It's from the DP of Leviathan. It's currently being described as something that is expected to be a beautifully strange, complex, and nuanced musical. You know, it could be like this year's Everything Everywhere All at Once, maybe. Something that is like just a smash with critics, perhaps. And it's also being distributed by Neon. So keep an eye out for that one. And next, that's where I have Gladiator 2, directed by Ridley Scott. 
uh, starring Paul Mescal, uh, Denzel Washington, Pedro Pascal. It's from the writer of Napoleon. So I believe the plot is going to follow Lucius, who was the son of Maximus. I read that the budget is 250 to 300. Is that a typo? 250 to 310 million dollar budget? Crazy. Ridley Scott said at CinemaCon that it may be even more extraordinary than the first, so take that as you may. It got some really great reactions from what I've seen of the footage they've shown. So yeah, the confidence in Ridley Scott is not fully there, but I would like to see it happen. I would like to see it happen. I think it's gonna be a really fun movie though. So the next film I have a Nora. This is the Sean Baker movie. It's a comedy, I believe, about a sex worker a show in New York City and Las Vegas. It's starring Mikey Madison, and the cinematographer is Drew Daniels, who did Waves. He did Red Rocket, and it comes at night. So it's expected to be shot on film. The plot is kind of giving me more Rocket, Red Rocket vibes over Florida Project vibes, but I, I love Sean Baker, so had to put him in there. Next, we have We Live in Time. This is directed by John Crowley, who did uh, Brooklyn and the Goldfinch. The plot is very secretive as of now, but it, it looks like a romance. Uh, it stars Andrew Garfield and Florence Pugh. It's called We Live in Time, so maybe there's some time travel elements to it. It's being distributed by A24, so it could be like maybe this year's past lives or I don't know. It's A24, and that, that's pretty much all I need to know to put on the list. Next, that's where I have Nosferatu, directed by Robert Edgers. It's starring uh, Nicholas Holt, uh, Bill Sarsgaard. He's playing the Count. And then we have Willem Dafoe, Aaron Taylor Johnson. This is a remake, of course, of the 1922 horror film. Uh, this has been, I believe, swirling around in Edgar's brain for a while. Distributed by Focus Features, and the release date is December 25th, so we all know what we're watching on Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. For In terms of Oscar potential, I was thinking maybe there could be like some nostalgia for the classic. Willem Dafoe played the Count in the, the Shadow of Vampire movie and was nominated for it back in the, the late 90s or early 2000s. I forget what year. Edgar's isn't maybe the director that's going to be like the, the Academy's cup of tea ever, but maybe there's going to be a nostalgia factor that gets him in. Who knows? That's why I put it in there. And talking about directors who may never be the Oscars cup of tea, next I have Mother May, directed by David Lowry. This is the director of um, Ghost Story and Green Knight. He also did um, movies like Peter Pan and and Wendy, which I, I genuinely had no idea he directed, and I even forgot the movie even existed, and it makes me want to watch it. Mother May is starring Anne Hathaway. It's following the relationship between a fictional uh, musician and a famous fashion designer. We got the cinematographer from A Ghost Story and Green Knight coming back to, to shoot this. It's being distributed by A24. You know, I, ultimately, I don't know if this is going to be an Academy player at all. It sounds like a movie I'm definitely going to watch. Uh, but yeah. Next, we got Didi, directed by Sean Wang, previously nominated for the short film Nai Nai and Wai Pao. And this film won Audience Choice Award at Sundance. I reviewed it. I'll put a link here if you want to watch that review. It's, it's very much like 8th grade, though. Very, very fun movie. Eighth Grade wasn't nominated for Best Picture, but I'm putting it on the list because I feel like Wang is just kind of a director right now who I feel like uh, attracts eyeballs. And also one audience choice, so you can't uh, dismiss it. And then next I have His Three Daughters. This was a film that played at TIFF. It's got Natasha Lyonne in it. It's got uh, Elizabeth uh, Olsen in it. It's got uh, Carrie Coon in it. It's being distributed by Netflix, and I think this movie has a lot of um, actor potential. I think it's possible that all three of them can just like get nominated. It has a very like um, Woody Allen kind of um, Hannah and her sisters kind of vibe to it. So yeah, I feel like it's a very strong actor and screenplay potential movie. I, I don't think it could ever win Best Picture, but I'm just putting it in there as a film that could potentially snag that ninth or tenth spot. The Struggle is also, it's a one location movie, but I will say it's one of the better one location movies that I've seen. Okay, so the next film I have on the list is a movie called Here. This is by Robert Zemeckis. The screenplay though is by Eric Roth. And check this out, the last films he's written, Kills of the Flower Moon, Dune, A Star is Born, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, The Curious Base of Benjamin Button, all 
Best Picture nominees. So that sounds really good. The problem is more Bob Zemeckis. The last films he directed, Pinocchio, The Witches, Welcome to Marwin, Allied. All not Best Picture nominees. The film stars Tom Hanks and Robin Wright. The story is based off a graphic novel or comic, I believe, of the same name. It covers the events of a single room and its inhabitants spanning from the past to well into the future. Um, it's being released, though, on November 15th by Miramax and Sony Pictures. It's kind of interesting. The film uses new generative artificial intelligence technology called Metaphysics Live to... Uh, face swap and de-age in real time as they perform instead of using additional uh, post-production processing methods. So I don't know if the film wasn't using AI technology, I, I may put this in my top 10, but Zemeckis' track record of late has just been like at a place where, you know, like fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice, you know? So I don't know. It's, it's a big question mark. There's some intriguing elements in there. I think the first one being written by Eric Roth. Yeah, but I don't know. Zemeckis with technology. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right, next we have on, uh, Emmanuel, directed by Audrey Diwan, starring uh, Nomi Mirlant from Tar and uh, Nomi Watts. The plot I've seen is it follows a woman in the series of erotic fantasies that she entertains. Honestly, I'm just trying to keep an eye out for this year's potential, you know, like Anatomy of a Fall, the big festival surprise so that's why i have this one in here maybe this could be this year's next i have megalopolis this is where i put it it's so far down the list and i apologize i want to put it higher it's directed by francis ford coppola it's starring adam driver audrey plaza jason schwartzman shia labeouf dustin hoffman john voigt and grace vanderwall so already won already won the Strangest Cast Award. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola, man, this is a movie that he conceived this idea when filming Apocalypse Now. It's been decades in the making. You know, Coppola is self-financing, which I think is incredible. He, uh, I believe he sold a significant piece of his wine empire to produce it. The reported budget has ballooned, I believe, even higher than its original budget of $120 million. Damn! I just know that when you have a movie that costs $120 million, you definitely cash Shia LaBeouf. That's definitely not going to hurt your reviews and prospects of selling. Not at all. That's sarcasm. It's just wild that this film even got made. But the film is set to premiere at Cannes uh, in May. Early reactions from the preview screenings from those who've actually seen it compared it to being a mix of Ayn Rand with Metropolis and Caligula. I would say, though, the movie could speak to the older Academy, who might be kind of rooting for a Francis Coppola return. Also, the narrative of, of him self-financing is kind of very intriguing. Metropolis is definitely a big risk, but that could equal either big miss or big reward, and, and time will tell. Right now, it's being described as featuring very complex themes, and, and complex doesn't typically translate to Oscars, so I'm just going to can chop this up to being the most interesting odd movie of the year, I imagine. But man, am I rooting for it. I'm very much rooting for it. I would love to see this get nominated. All right, the next film on the list, I have Juror Number 2. This is directed by Clint Eastwood. It's starring Nicholas Holt, uh, Tony Collette, J.K. Simmons. Its uh, plot surrounds a, a juror serving on a murder trial and realizes that he might actually be at fault for the victim's death. It's written by Jonathan Abrams, which I looked him up, and I don't, I don't think this dude has written really pretty much anything. Um, it's distributed by Warner Brothers. Obviously, it's on the list because it's Clint Eastwood. Uh, I mean, he has a, a very uh, strong history with the Academy, but his last film, few films really haven't done it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Put it on the list. You never know. Could be a return for him, but he, he is getting pretty up there in age. The next film I have on the list, I actually have The Outrun. Uh, this premiered at Sundance. It's starring Saoirse Ronan. I also reviewed it as well. Put the link up there. Um, this is like Wild, the movie uh, Wild with um, Reese Witherspoon. Uh, Saoirse Ronan, though, I could see potentially win for this, which would boost the film's chances. 
I don't know. I guess ultimately I don't think it's going to be nominated, but if it was nominated, I guess I wouldn't be completely floored, which is why I had to put it on the list somewhere. Other films that I think could possibly happen, uh, Flint Strong. It's a boxing movie written by Barry Jenkins. Uh, Wicked, Wicked just looks uh, gross to me. I don't think that's going to get nominated. And then there's a movie called Mickey 17. This is a Bong Joon Ho's film starring Robert Pattinson. Uh, I see it's being released though in 2024 five in January. Um, so I don't think it's going to even be eligible. I don't know. Let me know in the comment section below if this is eligible. If it's eligible, I'm putting it on the list, but I think from what I saw, it's going to be released here in January. So I don't think it's going to be eligible. And another film, uh, Woman of the Hour. That's another film I wouldn't totally disregard. It's directed by Anna Kendrick. This premiered at TIFF last year. It's like a, a thriller drama. Um, I think it's really pretty well directed though, man, I could direct it. And I think it could be a film that I wouldn't be surprised that people liked it a lot more or that picks up a lot of steam when it comes and uh, drops on Netflix later this year. But yeah, other than that, that's, that's pretty much all I got. So those are my very early uh, predicted nominees for best picture. Now I typically make very bold early predictions, including the winners, but I decided to make that into a um, separate video. So look out for an upcoming video where I make my very bold Oscar predictions for the winners of 2025. And I'll also uh, take a look at my early predictions that I got right or dead wrong last year. But other than that, I'm, I'm really excited for this year's slate of films and I hope that this video got you excited for the films coming out this year because that was the goal. But let me know what film you think is gonna be a big contender for the 2025 Oscars or you know, what films should have made this list. Now, if you like this video and want to see even more Oscar and movie related content, feel free to hit the subscribe button down below. You can also follow me on Letterboxd or Twitter. Got those links in the bio. Thanks always for watching. And until next time, I will see you at the Oscars. Whew, that's a lot of films. Must have forgot a film somewhere.